Thank you very much and welcome to the second day of our first GTC here in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, I hope you thought the first day was great. I certainly did. Um, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning yesterday, if you happen to catch the, uh, the opening session, we're completely sold out, um, both uh, for the conference itself and also for the deep learning training that we're doing through what we call the NVIDIA Deep Learning Institute. So uh, the sessions have been uh, full with really great content. Um, I think uh, our healthcare track in particular is really outstanding. I was able to catch a, a few of the sessions yesterday and just, just amazing. And, and it was wonderful to, to uh, be able to have um, the, uh, the speakers that we had yesterday during our keynotes and, and also the panel afterwards give you uh, what I think was a really good idea about uh, the issues uh, that we have as a, as a country and where we do funding and how much funding and how quickly we fund things around, uh, for, um, around artificial intelligence and deep learning. Uh, that is the main focus of, of our conference, really around this explosion that's happening in, uh, in deep learning and AI, but it's certainly not the only thing that's going on. Um, for instance, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to see all of the demos that both our sponsors have and that NVIDIA has as well, I suggest you check those out, particularly the VR ones. If you haven't gone over to the VR area back there, you, you really owe it to yourself to do it because um, even if you've seen VR before, we have some things here that I can almost guarantee you've never seen before because it really is at, at the leading edge. And for those of you that are interested uh, in engineering in particular, uh, check out what we're doing with visualizing point cloud data as we're building our own campus and, and using our own technology to visualize that uh, uh, with real-time ray tracing as well. And also, um, we've got a light field demo there so that you can, you can see at a level of visual fidelity that I can pretty well guarantee, unless you've seen this demo before, you've never seen before in VR. So a lot of great stuff in addition to the, uh, the great talks. Um, so great day, and we have a great keynote, and I'd like to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for this morning as well. Jerry Lee is the Deputy Director for Cancer Research and Technology uh, for the Cancer Moonshot Task Force. Prior to his role, he spent the last decade in the National Cancer Institute office of the director developing and implementing over a dozen large-scale advanced technology initiatives as the deputy director of NCI's Center for Strategic Scientific Initiatives. Prior to joining the NCI, his research involved elucidating mechanisms of age-related diseases, and he's co-authored over 20 papers, five book chapters, and one book. He continues his research as an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University, where he also earned his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering and PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Dr. Lee also holds an appointment at the Washington, D.C. Veterans Affairs Medical Center and collaborates with clinicians on next-generation patient-centered outcomes research. He's a member of the Innovation Policy Forum of the National Acad Academies Board on Science, Technology, and Economic Policy and the foundation for the NIH Biomarkers Consortium Cancer Steering Committee, and Health and Environmental Sciences Institute's Board of Trustees, and the editorial board of the Convergent Science Physical Oncology Journal. Please help me welcome Dr. Jerry Lee. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, for coming here this morning. Uh, what a month October has been. Cubs are in the World Series. They're even. And the White House just released uh, a couple of sets of reports thinking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, as well as our Cancer Moonshot Task Force report, both at the White House as well as the Cancer Institute's uh, Blue Ribbon Panel. And I'm really excited as I'm coming to this particular community uh, with this as a backdrop. For one reason, as I look into your field, machine learning and deep learning, this is what I'm really excited about. The fact that machine learning works best when it is infeasible or difficult to write down explicit rules to solve a problem. And any of you here in the audience, I'm going to have a lot of audience participation in the talk today, so 
Um, how many of you have been affected by the disease or know someone that has been affected by this disease? And how many of you always hear, either yourselves or others, that cancer just obeys its own rules? It right? figures out how to get around the rules that we as humans think it should follow, but it doesn't. And this is, for me, one of the main attractions of the fact that machine learning could be potentially applied to solve this very, very difficult problem. But I just want to get a sense of who's in the room, and the room's a little bit dark, so I'm hoping this works well. If you could please raise your smartphones when I ask you this question so I can at least see. And for those of you that have already checked out, that's fine, you can continue to read the news. Um, but as you think about in 2021, 2026, you're sitting in an office, either yourself or someone that you know um, is seeing an oncologist, who is standing next to that physician and helping them out if we are successful in doing what we're doing here? Who's helping that particular physician? And I'm gonna apologize in advance to the Trekkies in the room. Is the person standing and helping your physician um, C-3PO, right? translates, understands, can, can talk 3,000 different languages, but provides no context. How many people would want C-3PO next to their physician? One, wow, that's very lonely. Two, right, look around. This is not what you're building or what someone else is building. Who would you want standing next to your physician? Would you prefer R2? Doesn't really say much. Beeps. Right, how many people want R2? One, two, three, four. Right, those that didn't raise their phones, how many of you choose neither? You just want your physician to continue to practice medicine the good old fashioned way. I don't see any phones there. How many of you see them come as a pair? Any, many more. All right, so th look around at the developers, uh, the folks in the audience that are raising their phones. Those are the audience members that you're building for. Because if that's what you think machine learning, deep learning could do for your physician, please make sure to put that in context as you're trying to build out these type of algorithms to help that physician in 2021, 2026. So I'm excited also to be here because, as the report indicates, um, deep learning is still a relatively nascent field. Um, not because, again, as we heard from Bill yesterday, that the technology is not there, the algorithm is not there. It's the fact that some of the technology is finally feasible and the data sets are finally available to do this. And this is part of the White House report. And, and I tried to search with those same keywords deep learning and cancer, I didn't get very many papers, um, so I didn't want to show that. But we definitely here at the Cancer Moonshot have heard from all sorts of companies thinking about considering applying algorithms to either precision medicine, to Cancer Moonshot, ranging from IBM, Google, uh, Microsoft, and all of them always come to us with one request, that really to effectively apply machine learning, you need a historical data set, and we heard that yesterday, that when you build this historical data set, you split this out to a training set and a test set, but most importantly, you need ground truth in these test sets and training sets, or what I at least over the past couple of months have continually heard from your audience. So I'm gonna walk you through a historical data set that the Cancer Institute has built, uh, and the Moonshot has extended and hopefully all of you will be not only willing to take a stab at that historical data set, but also the new data sets that we're gonna be putting out. But just to put into context, because yesterday we heard a lot about taking images of cats and we need you know, one million images or billions of images, um, a couple of statistics for those in the room. Right, this is our upper bound, one, and it's a good upper bound. 1.6 million new cases of cancer in the US about 600,000 patients, unfortunately, succumbing to the disease. So when you come and say, I need billions of images, um, we, we, we don't have that. Um, but what we do have over the past 40 years of treating and thinking through this disease is about 15 and a half million survivors 
in the U.S. And that number is slated to get to about 20 million by 2024. So how do we learn more from those survivor experiences and not just you have the disease, you're treated with the disease, that's sort of a, a boundary limit. And then some of the terminology that I'm going to use, I'm assuming there, there aren't too many cancer experts in the room, and if you are, please cover your ears. Um, a couple of just, just setting a terminology straight that I'll be using throughout the talk. Um, many of you hear the words tumor, cancer, and metastases and think that it's interchangeable. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer, as you have heard, and, and for me, length scale, time scale really matter when I talk about a problem. Um, and for me, if you take a look at primary tumor, that very initiation, we do a pretty good job with that disease. Your survival is generally not terrible. It's when it begins to move from that primary location and metastasize, becomes cancer, invades, that's when those numbers really dismally drop. And being able to understand not just that primary tumor, but all of that um, information that occurs over time, those are some of the things that we've been grappling with uh, in our community. So if you hear me say the word primary tumor, secondary tumor, metastases, this is what I mean, and keep this sort of in the back of your brain uh, as we think about the longitudinal data sets. So the historical data set I really want to talk to you about that we've been culling and curating over the past 10 years at the Cancer Institute um, really looks at trying to understand the underlying causes of primary untreated tumors. We're trying to give you as baseline as possible. And with that, not only did we do genomics, proteomics, but also medical imaging on about 12,000 patients, and those data sets are currently available today. Why did we spend so much time doing that, and why did we have to do this very carefully? Uh, well, in the early years, 2002 to 2004, if you've not been in this field, there were a couple of papers that came out on one to 10 patient samples that were a little hard to reproduce, and not only did it generate some hope for those cancer patients in 2002, but then some concern just two years later when those results couldn't be uh, reproduced by other labs. And as a chemical engineer, for me, we really want to make sure that what we're giving to a community is truly as close to ground truth as we can possibly enable at the time of that data being generated. So with that, um, you'll see um, one of the things that I was quite surprised with when I started with the Institute in 2006 um, is that this particular atlas really obeyed a lot of the things that we as chemical engineers think about, uh, answering something as simple as what is water. We can answer it by what does it look like, what's the color, what's the taste. We could also answer it with what kind of phase is it in. Is it a liquid, a solid, uh, or a gas? And of course, as engineers, what do we love to do? We love to measure. Right? Once we started measuring, we generated a lot of data, and then we started generating some disagreements. Water boiling at 92 degrees instead of 100 degrees. And for the chemis in the room or, or the uh, engineers in the room, you all know what we then ended up having to do is make sure that we were all measuring the same water. We were all using the same thermometer. And what we ended up finding is that everyone was right. We just couldn't see pressure. We didn't realize that that was something that was involved. And once we were able to generate a reproducible table or steam table, what could we then do was really generate phase diagrams so that we can really appreciate all the different ways that water can sit in different temperatures and pressures. And one of the concepts that I still have a hard time conveying to my life scientist colleagues, so please I look to you to help me explain this a little bit better, is the concept of a triple point uh, in which at that particular time, uh, temperature and pressure, uh, it exists as a gas, a solid, and a liquid. And for those of you who have not seen that before, just a quick video, you know, is this, again, uh, perhaps how cancer uh, really sits? It doesn't really sit as one state or another. And what you're seeing is this, this particular element not really able to decide should it stay as a solid or a liquid, and it's all three at once. Um, and that type of mentality is where I'm hoping with machine learning, deep learning, some of the things that you're doing, you can actually help me convey better to my colleagues, 
is cancer this very complex dynamic system that we just can't hold on to and understand. But coming back to the historical data sets, um, when we looked out there, there were a whole lot of thermometers in 2006. Everybody had their favorite way to measure, genomics, proteomics. Um, we had to actually find this out the hard way that when we said, are you measuring the same thing? Uh, I don't know how many of you work with patient samples or have uh, collaborators that give you cancer samples. Ask them some of these tough questions. The fact that on a Wednesday, you're more likely to be improperly diagnosed, not because your tissue's any different, but because looking at the blue arrows, the workload was a little bit different. And these are the type of questions I invite you to keep asking as you work on, obtain, or get data sets. These little nuances make a big difference. And if some of you feel like, how come I've never heard of this data set before? Um, well, we really got an infusion of funding from the president in 2009 um, to go from perhaps doing 2,000 samples to completing within two years uh, 10,000 samples. And this rapid acceleration has really allowed us to provide a very highly curated, highly annotated data set for you to think through. And what does that data set kind of look like? Well, I, I don't have very fancy, fancy analysis tools, so I'm hoping uh, those of you who are thinking in the audience, I could do so much better. Um, the data sets are available, and we really encourage you to try it out. But up here, each row is one patient each column, one, two, 23. And you can see, without very much analytic uh, uh, pattern recognition, that, that something is a little bit different about all the cancers, but some things are a little bit similar. How does a human actually think through all of this um, is some of the things that I'm really hoping that you'll have a chance to help us out with. And for those of you that aren't used to dealing with genomics data, what we also provided for every single sample is the capacity to look at pathology images of each of these patients. And if image segmentation is what you're interested in, uh, we have the capacity to really deep dive and go in and take a look at some of these pictures that correspond to these patients. And if you aren't a big fan of this type of imaging, um, for those same patients, we also went out and carefully curated medical images, CT, MRI, um, and that's also a public data set that is available. So hopefully, depending on what type of research and what kind of things you're interested in, this historical data set could be used either to train, to test, your choice, um, but we really wanted to give you that awareness. But what did we do with that data set? Of course, with the Cancer Institute, um, we took many of those molecular signatures and launched uh, for the very first time what we call the NCI match trial last June, where we actually take some of those genomic markers and match you to a particular therapy that is not yet approved. Why is that important? Because if you look up top, uh, match trial is for patients in which standard treatment, no, they, they're no longer responding to standard treatment. And with that, we try our best to match individual um, genomic profiling, to available therapies, and this infographic is, is a little bit optimistic in that we're able to actually match about 60%, we're really at about 25%. Um, but this, this, that piece over there where not all patients will have a match is where we then took an additional step to make sure that, that if genomics was not the only answer, what else would we provide to this community? So we went back uh, in 2011 and actually took 100 samples, the same samples, not similar samples, but the same exact samples were uh, proteomically characterized to make sure that we would have yet another dimension to that data set. And what did we really want to test? Well, this was uh, the closest thing that I could find to a law, a theorem, or a something in biology. Um, I don't know how many of you remember your, your 101 bio the central dogma of biology, that it's DNA, RNA, and protein. This is audience participation time again. How many of you think that before we release this data set, that the RNA sequencing that we did on those patients, those 300 patients, predicted 90% of the protein that we found? 
One, two, three, four, five, and a wave. Thank you. All right. How many people think 10%? A few more hands. Okay. 50? Already checking news. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the answer is about 33%. So 33% followed what we have long held as dogma, and 66% is where I'm hoping, again, machine learning, deep learning, all the things that it claims to be able to do, to be able to think through non-explicit rules, is where you can help. And we didn't do this just for one set when we published the, this particular paper, when I say we really need your help, we purposefully called, and this is the, just the colorectal uh, cancer data set, we called the five subtypes that we pulled out with clustering, very simple clustering, um, using proteomics, A, B, C, D, and E. And we called it that because we didn't want to yet assign biological or clinical meaning to that, those subtypes because we weren't sure if we'd see them again. And later this year, we will release another 300 samples done in the same fashion to see if A, B, C, D, and E come back. So those of you that think about designing challenges or designing uh, different aspects of your training and test set, another set of data is coming. And no better way to tell you that this is really the frontier than having my boss, uh, Doug Lowy, uh, really ever talk about the fact that we can now uh, reproducibly generate this genomic proteomic data so that we can think about things that were difficult or impossible even to infer from genomic data alone. And it is around this time, this April, that I got a second call from my new boss, um, Vice President, which of course for the Cancer Moonshot, his favorite line to use is make a decade's worth of progress and ultimately end cancer as we know it which when he stepped in and said, well, what does a decade of progress look like? And I gave him this particular decade that I was fortunate enough to be a part of at the Cancer Institute. He said, well, how can we move that even faster? Which, you know, for me, having done some of the things that, that we had um, pushed, it was quite a, a tall task to replicate that decade and shrink it down to five years. Um, but it's something that, that I think you'll soon hear that not only with um, your help or our cancer community help we were actually able to do for the vice president. The moonshot itself, uh, for those of you that have not read our report cover to cover yet, um, spans five strategic aims, uh, strategic goals. The one that I think is most pertinent to this crowd, of course, is unleashing the power of data. And what do we mean by that? And because we no longer use PDFs, um, for those of you that are interested, the report itself is interactive uh, and online. And I've just pulled up just the strategic goal two, unleashing the power of data. When we have 20 different federal agencies working together, what does that mean? And for us, what we really wanted to put out um, as a moonshot type goal for data is to develop a national learning healthcare system. And why is that important? But without a national healthcare learning system, how many of you go to a cancer center for your primary care? I, I hope none. And how many of you, after you finish, or you think when patients finish their therapy, the first thing on their mind is, man, I can't wait to sign all those data release forms so I can take all the data with me when I go back to primary care. No, it's, I'm so glad to get out of there, right? And as you can see, we're losing a lot of opportunities to learn about you pre-cancer, learn about you post-treatment. And if you do return to the same exact cancer care facility, maybe we'll have a shot at learning about you the first go around. But the fact that all of those seem to be data choke points uh, was something that we wanted to address at the Cancer Moonshot. And thankfully, uh, as I mentioned before, NCI also commissioned a very deep science panel, uh, a blue ribbon panel, and their 10 recommendations that are more scientific, less policy, uh, was also released. And as you can see in red, uh, these are some of the topics that I think this audience may be most interested in. Um, and again, this building this national cancer data ecosystem, 
uh, and having the capacity or patient involvement was very important uh, as we asked both the experts and our federal colleagues. Certainly did not come close to doing this alone. Uh, the Cancer Moonshot for us, we spent uh, since February till, uh, and we're still having these meetings. Um, all of these members meet every other week from the federal agencies to think about what else we can do to bridge them together. I really have to thank my co-chairs, uh, Dimitri at DOE uh, and DJ Patel at the Office of Science Technology Policy for helping to drive a whole swath of different agencies from NASA to DOE to DOE, um, Patent Office and even our arts um, to think about this problem. And coming back to our vision, Right. We really want to see if we can build across the federal government and outside the federal government a national learning healthcare system for cancer, where as a nation we learn from all the contributed knowledge of every patient to enhance, improve, and inform the journey of every cancer patient from the point of diagnosis through survivorship. So that 1.6 and that 15 and a half million. Right. How do we get that possible? With that, we had three priority areas that we wanted to tackle. If you build it, enable a seamless data environment, make it easy and relevant to use, hopefully they will come, develop a workforce. I'm gonna give you five quick examples of each of these areas and some of the things that you would wanna learn more about. Again, please feel free to check out our report. Uh, the first of which is to make data easily movable and accessible. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, through their MVP Champion project, Computational Health Analytics for Medical Precision to Improve Outcomes Now, um, I love those acronyms, um, has, will be moving and is currently in the process of moving about a half a million data set, uh, a half a million patient, uh, people worth of data sets from the VA's Million Veterans Program to the Department of Energy with the hopes that that will help us compute things a little bit faster when we move the data to where the compute is. On the other end of the spectrum, so it's not all molecular data, Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs are also pulling together something what they call as the Da Vinci Project uh, for clinical intelligence, they are going to sync up uh, all the e uh, medical records and health records between the population that the DOD serves, the population that the VA serves, so again, we can think about what that continuum could look like. And to make the data sets easy to use, because I will admit that the first couple of iterations of the Cancer Genome Atlas was a little bit uh, built for uh, those that know how to use those data sets. Vice President launched for us on June 6 what we now call the Genomic Data Commons. How many of you use the Genomic Data Commons? One, two, three, hopefully we'll have a couple of converts um, by the end of this talk. The Genomic Data Commons for us uh, represents two things. One, it's taking that decade historical data set uh, and harmonizing it for those of you that are interested to compute across all uh, of those 14,000 patient data sets, we went back, got raw data sets, and because while we were curating or generating those data sets, uh, sequencing technology advanced, and we tried to find the best way to harmonize how to think about something that was generated in 2006, to be able to compare that to data sets generated in 2016, uh, 2014. Um, and really, truly, to the power of the voice of the Vice President, we launched that particular platform on June 6. As of today, we have about 5 million downloads worldwide. Um, and that, for me, really not only says that the Genomic Data Commons is ready for you to go and access that data, but that we're getting the entire community excited about thinking through this data. And it's not just the public sector data that we now have in the Genomic Data Commons. In June, at the Vice President's Summit at Howard University, Foundation Medicine, one of the largest sequencing-based private uh, companies, donated about 18,000 genomic uh, profiles to the Genomic Data Commons. So now we could conceivably think about this as a 32,000 patient resource. 
And what else is coming? In the next uh, one to three years, that match trial that I mentioned to you, in which we're seeing about 5,000 patients treated at the other end of that spectrum, that secondary cancer, uh, all of those cases will be placed into the Genomic Data Commons. Um, we have additional donations that are coming in from the public and private sectors. And then through the Moonshot effort itself, we're going to be generating, uh, with the help of the VA and the DOD, that very last piece on the, po uh, on the bottom, the Apollo program is one that we specifically built for the Vice President to really address the second part of his statement, as we know it. Right? For those of you that um, raised your hand for the less than 50%, um, when we had a chance to talk to the Vice President about what proteomics could bring by giving that extra dimension to the data. He said, well, could we build something like that, but larger? You know, he looked at me, uh, our team, and said, you did this for the genomics. I don't have a lot of money to give you. In fact, I have no money to give you. But what I can give you are agencies and my voice to tell the agencies to help get you, or international uh, venues to get you to that particular acceleration so that rather than only having about 1,000 cases in the next five years for proteogenomics, perhaps we could get up to five to 8,000. And I really have to credit these three, uh, Colonel Craig Shriver, Jennifer Lee over at the VA, and Henry Rodriguez at the NCI. The three of them, um, we pulled together on May 26th. By May 28th, these three agencies had a draft memorandum of understanding was signed two, three, three weeks later at their senior leadership level to build what is now called uh, this Apollo Network. And please feel free to check out uh, the Medium post on it. Um, but in short, what did we do with this uh, particular effort? We tried to say, well, since the VA hospitals and the DOD hospitals do see the patients before cancer, after cancer, could we begin to close that continuum? And what we ended up doing is harnessing uh, the capacity of the VA, the DOD, um, with some of the knowledge generation developed at the NCI. And we will collectively look at 8,000 lung cancer patients together, make those data sets publicly available as they are generated, and hopefully reach 8,000 by 2021. And really, again, coming back to that first figure, what is Apollo doing for us? It's really helping us fill in that gap between that first primary cancer and when we see them again in NCI match, when they've been subjected to all sorts of therapies that didn't work, um, and that was the two time points that I think Apollo does for us. And one of the things that we're really excited, not just for the molecular data, but the fact that th the Apollo initiative is gonna take place in a usual care environment. Department of Veterans Affairs, hospitals, our DRD Mirtha Cancer Center, we're just gonna layer on top of how physicians are already treating those cancer patients, the capacity to obtain not just research data, genomic, proteomic, but also the medical record and health record information about that particular patient. And not just when they are under cancer care, but under their entire care continuum. And for us, we're really excited about Apollo, again, to fill that middle void, but to really give us that time resolution, that longitudinal data set that I think some of your machine learning algorithms may need. And the Vice President, true to his word, not only did he learn a new word, which I, I'm really, really excited, um, that he now goes out and speaks about proteogenomics and, and thinks about it as sort of the genes being the entire roster of a basketball team and the proteins being the five starters that you have to defend against. But he went out in July of this year and secured additional commitments from uh, our partners in Australia, because Australia was thinking about doing this proteogenomics on about 60,000 or 50,000 patients or so, and combining their efforts with our efforts and the fact that we are going to be sharing how we collect that molecular data, how we collect some of that patient phenotype data, those data sets are going to be as harmonized as we can possibly make them and hopefully give to this community a set of 60,000 patients worth of information by 2021. 
And of course, because the vice president said that it's, um, he's predicting that it's going to be repeated around the world, we then spent the next two months making that prediction a reality. So at the UN General Assembly Social Goodwill meeting, uh, Vice President announced additional six countries that have joined this effort now. China, Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, Canada, Switzerland, to do the same exact proteogenomic profiling. And I was telling Greg and others, it was very exciting to see where you've been hosting these GTCs. Uh, the fact that some of the same countries that you've been holding these GTCs are the same countries that are going to be generating these data sets for us. And sometimes when you hear about these type of uh, memorandums, are they just sort of words, we did something that was nice, we put out a report, did we actually do something, or what are we doing right now? Are we just waiting? Uh, we're not just waiting. So on August 29th, the DOD convened all of the pathologists, oncologists, technologists, data scientists that are going to be part of this Apollo effort together to think through how we start generating data right now. And one of the things that if you would like to get started playing with these types of data sets, uh, we were able to locate about 42 patients in which we have genomics, proteomics, and medical imaging already on those patients. So you're chomping at the bits to start testing. Um, these data sets are available. The DOD, in an effort to also get more pathology images out there, um, Colonel Clayton Smith will be digitizing 55 million slides from about 3.4 million cases. And this phase one digitization, he's hoping to complete uh, and have data sets go out on a rolling basis so that hopefully, again, we can begin to apply some of the deep learning algorithms uh, on 55 million images. Um, those, of course, are not going to be uh, all Apollo, um, but hopefully that, again, will give you a chance to either use that as a test set, a training set, um, for your purposes. So for those of you who have been following, what I've really described to you is still three distinct states, primary tumor, metastases, that, that middle ground. How do we actually begin to traverse between these three states? That was also something that the Vice President was keen to think about. How do we actually go beyond, how do we think about all those intermediary time points? How do we think about what's happening when it is going from that primary tumor and moving to that secondary site? And as a chemical engineer, this is something that has always boggled me because it's a very hard time and space problem. You know, do I look at you every day? Do I look at you every other day? Where do I look? How do I look? Because in the grand scheme of things, metastases is actually very, very inefficient. Just to put some numbers around that, about 0.01% of circulating cells that make it into your bloodstream actually show up as distant colonies. And a one cubic centimeter tumor mass sheds about a million cells per day. A lot of events happening. And one of the things that we immediately, of course, turn to um, is imaging, where you see on one side localized disease M0, metastases labeled as M1. And one of the things that I think we also have to change is how we classify, because this M1 is classified the same as this M1. And I cannot believe this is relevant again, but um, I've used this slide about four, uh, a few years ago, but it really doesn't take machine learning to tell you that M1 and M1 are not the same thing. So in addition to imaging, uh, one of the places that the Vice President was keen to think about are, of course, some of the technologies you're hearing to assess things in blood. Could we take routine blood draws? Could we think about what to do with uh, things that we find in the blood draws? Um, there are technologies that are claiming they're able to find uh, cell-free DNA from tumors before they become large enough or be able to characterize circulating tumor cells. And when the Vice President asked about this sort of needle in a haystack problem, um, of course I groaned because it's something that our field has struggled with. And it's struggled with because we have a whole source, uh, various sources of getting these needles. Sometimes it's 
for good, fetal DNA. Sometimes it's bad, tumor. And how to sort out the good actors from the bad actors. When do you actually take those blood draws? When do you determine that is, is really finding not just the right needle, but finding the right needle at the right time of the disease. And with all of the possibilities of things that you could find, I'm hoping you probably know my answer to his request was, why don't we build an atlas? Why don't we try to find a way to get everyone that is building these type of technologies to donate what they find, when they find it, what do they look like, so that we can begin to build that same steam table, but for blood. Everybody told us it couldn't be done because this is a very highly competitive field as we speak. Uh, with the help of our Director of External Partnerships, Lauren Lyman, who's sitting in the front here, uh, we were able to realize Vice President's request in which 20 different stakeholders, pharma, biotech, academic, came together to donate data sets from about 13 different studies so that, again, this community could perhaps, down the road, think about not just those two tissue time points, but that intermediary blood time point from that same patient. And while this is not yet ready for prime time, I will show you one of the technologies that already has deposited their data sets into our system. It's a very brute force technology. Rather than taking seven and a half mils of blood and trying to find that needle, the investigator puts all seven and a half mils down on 16 slides. He then takes images, quite a few, and then does post-processing analysis, something that I'm hoping with the help of the the GPUs, maybe that's something that we could do down the road on the fly rather than post-processing. And you're seeing this is, you know, someone is sitting there, a graduate student is looking through these, these many, many, many images just trying to label, is this cancer, is this not cancer? And ground truth is a little bit easier here because, as you can tell, since we don't do any enrichment, all of the green cells, the healthy immune cells, are still there to see if you have any artifacts. And I'm hoping that you get a chance to, to think about or go and play with these first data sets of data before we get our atlas done. Uh, what's available right now on about 100 patients, uh, 7,000 uh, blood draws, are these particular images uh, in which we've done very, very rudimentary analysis on these circulating tumor cells that I hope, again, with some of your algorithms, technologies, we can take to that next level. And we're not just sitting around waiting for this atlas to materialize. The next day, after the vice president announced this, we convened all 20 companies uh, to the White House and really thought through, heard from every one of them little nuances like, do I store that tube of blood at 4 degrees, 25 degrees, 37 degrees? Do I spin it once? Do I spin it twice? So all of these little nuances so that once those data sets are put out there, it's as close to ground truth as possible. And while I don't have something as cool as pulling a chip out of my pocket, um, I am happy to announce the team has been working all night. Um, the blood profiling atlas itself uh, is something uh, we're releasing and announcing today uh, at GTC. And we're really excited that not just these initial 20 stakeholders have come to the table, including the FDA, um, but we are constantly now getting phone calls from others saying, well, how can I join? How can I participate? How can I give those data sets away as well? Really, in, in closing, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what life was like uh, before the moonshot, which I think was not bad. We were going to continue to generate those data sets that I showed you. We'd get to about that 14,000. And then our match trial, we would start generating those, but it would be in a parallel line. Maybe someday we'd get them on the same patient. But I think both now combining the Apollo initiative, our blood profiling atlas, we're able to not only get those tissue time points, but also those intermediary time points on those patients. We're gonna work with our international colleagues. So by 2021, we have about 160,000 patients worth of this type of data for your teams to think about. And hopefully by that time, we're not just saying, oops, we should have started playing with those data sets a few years ago. And this cancer 
research data commons ecosystem is really where we're trending towards so that we can do our best to continue to provide this community data sets for you to play with, use, and give us feedback on. And who am I really, really targeting, in my opinion, personally? Um, I'm hopeful for that undergraduate, graduate student that when they were born in 1997, which is really hard for me to say, um, you know, when they were five years old, a thousand songs was ad-worthy by Apple. They will probably never hear the sound of a modem. They will not be able to buy a Walkman because it was discontinued. They're not going to think of big data as lots of data. And for those of you that are chuckling on the tech side, I have that same concern for those that are born in that 1996, 97, because that was when the first targeted agents, Perceptin for breast cancer, Imatinib for CML, were released. So just like how they won't be so wowed by Wi-Fi, they won't be so wowed by these targeted agents. They will think that that is the norm. So how do we build an environment for that workforce that really will benefit from these data sets is really the final piece of our cancer data track. How do we actually bridge this type of environment? Uh, one of the things that we have been leveraging and pushing is a big data scientist training program that we started with the VA um, back in 2014, which now expands hopefully uh, next year to include NSF, CDC, um, and FDA. And for those of you that have graduate students, graduate students yourself that would like to spend a year in one of our VAs trying to think about how to compute. Um, I really hope you get a chance to meet Connie, who's also sitting in the front row. Because these six sites that have been launched across the country, uh, we just got our second crop in, about 12 trainees, thinking about how to deal with messy clinical data, molecular data, all at once. And a personal wish list, and this is just opinions of Jerry, so please uh, take them with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm hoping that not only as time goes on will we have information about the cancer patient, but in due time, information about the, your, your healthy state. Uh, and when that happens, I'm really looking forward to a day where you can take some of these data sets and rather than just finding out what's unique about you or develop a cancer signature, to be able to take some of the technologies perhaps used to generate uh, things like Shazam, uh, purposely pulled up blurred lines, so hopefully we'll have uh, some blurred lines between uh, able to take a few seconds of what you do with spectrograms and think about how to match someone's cancer song to their life song. How do we think through that much data at once? How do we actually place them on some continuum? And hopefully on the second side, could we think about something like ways for cancer? in which each patient can, uh, their journey can be something that they can tell someone else about and share with someone else about so that they're not on this journey alone. And those that are riskier, that wanna take the highway, perhaps take clinical trials, can also share their path with those that may be taking uh, local, a little less risky. Those are things that I'm hoping still, I, I don't see R2, I don't see C3PO. Uh, these are some of the things that I'm hoping practically with these data sets and with your help we could perhaps get there. And I'm really, really enthusiastic, certainly about this group, because not just for the invitation to the first GTC, but also the fact that NVIDIA has been with us uh, uh, thinking about this problem before it was cool and chic, uh, launching with us in 2014 the very first proteogenomics data challenge. And I'm hoping we continue to partner um, to think about how some of the things that the data sets that we're generating from Cancer Moonshot could be applied. I really want to thank the people also uh, back at the NCI that make my job easy and really do all the hard work that make some of the th these things possible, as well as my new team since April, our Cancer Moonshot team back at the White House. And thank you so much for your attention uh, and happy to take questions afterwards uh, if you have any. Jerry, thank you so much. Wow, that was inspiring. Uh, 
clearly we have uh, a long way to go, uh, but clearly a lot of progress is being made. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I thought that talk gave me a lot to think about and uh, a lot of ways that we can contribute, uh, both with our data and also with uh, compute capabilities. I just want to run through a few housekeeping things um, uh, before I let you go here. Uh, one of the things is you'll see up, up uh, on the, the slide here, uh, again, an invitation to, uh, to come to our Silicon Valley conference. One thing I want to call out, you see that 40% discount? Um, uh, that is available to, uh, to all of you here, uh, as long as you use the same email uh, that, that you use to register here, we will, uh, we will get you that discount code once registration's uh, open. So, uh, th that's uh, the conclusion of our keynote today. Um, all the sessions in the training labs are, are beginning at 10 a.m. Uh, next up in this particular room is AI for the Internet of Things, uh, featuring Jesse Clayton of NVIDIA. Lunch is uh, from 12 uh, to 2 p.m. today in the atrium ballroom. Uh, and uh, I think that's it. Actually, registration, as I said, is going to open uh, in November. So enjoy the rest of the day, and thank you all for coming. And and thank you for helping us make GTC such a great success.